Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Norbert, and today I'll be telling you about my Crown Vic uh, project uh, that I swapped an LS into. Uh, this is a car that I owned uh, for about a year, year and a half, and had a lot of fun with. Um, obviously the Crown Vic needs no introduction. Um, big body on frame, uh, robust vehicle that a lot of uh, departments and other various services have used over the years. Um, uh, really a fun project overall. Um, I've done a couple of these swaps so far in various cars, uh, you know, BMWs and Corvettes and so on, um, LS and non-LS powered things, and uh, it's always a good time. You really can't argue with LS power. Of course, that's why you're watching this video, uh, because you understand the value uh, of LS engines and Crown Vics and uh, the combination that you can get out of them. Um, so the format for this video will basically be a slideshow. Um, I'll just go through and show my... Uh, pictures that I have of the project over the years, um, kind of talk about some of the progress that I made, uh, the parts that I used, um, and options you have for getting this setup running, uh, some of the lessons learned over the years from various LS swaps, uh, and some of the fun I had. Um, you know, this is really just a, a daily driver kind of street bruiser car for me. Um, didn't really have any big dreams of doing you know, running eights or nines of the drag strip or anything like that. So really just a burnout machine, uh, something that can drive to work and take the kids to ice cream and, you know, have fun and, and just destroy tires with. So um, we'll get right into it. Um, the car you're looking at here is actually the car that I swapped, obviously, uh, 2011 P7B, uh, ex New York State police car. Um, but if we're honest, this is actually the second vehicle that I owned, uh, second Crown Vic. Uh, so let's turn the clocks way back to 2018. Now in 2018 I picked up what you see here. Uh, this was a 2009 P71 model. Um, again, ex-New York State Police car, retired. Um, really nice shape, had pretty much no rust on it. Um, higher miles, somewhere in the 150s I think. Uh, and I basically drove this car for the summer just as a fun toy to, to bomb around in. So um, I installed some uh, lower rear springs out of like an OEM application. I think it was for like a Jeep or something, and I cut a coil off the front, and the thing dropped a couple inches and just looked awesome. It was a fun car to bomb around in. Um, not a total powerhouse, I mean, not a slouch, obviously, for the stock, you know, 4.6 uh, mod motor, but still a fun car to get around in and, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> threaten people on the highways, uh, as, as I'm sure we all have uh, dreamed about doing um, uh, with old retired police cars. Um, I, at the time I had a C5 Corvette too. that was an awesome car with a L92 all aluminum Gen 4 LS. Um, so definitely a fun summer in 2018 um, doing that. So I sold that car, uh, ended up having a couple of different toys, and eventually decided that, hey, you know, I really like the chassis. I love the Crown Vic. I want to get back into one, but I need a boatload more power. So um, I actually bought the engine and transmission that was going to go into it. Uh, before the car. So this is a Gen 3 uh, 6 liter uh, LQ4 out of like a 2004 Chevy Express van. Uh, 4L83 transmission. Um, dragged that thing home with my work truck as you can see there. My E92 M3 that I still have. Uh, also a great car. Um, dragged it home, strapped it down, uh, took a look at it. You know, all the goodies here. 317 heads, pretty much boost ready as they say. Uh, you know, factory configuration. So um, I thought it was a great motor as received in terms of condition, um, but unfortunately the engine had some other surprises in terms of just general wear and tear and, and usage. So, um, so I get it rolled into the street, we hook up the pressure washer, I have my lovely wife um, hose this thing down, get all the grease and grime off. Uh, <laughs> the funny part is I think we had like a baby prior to, um, a month or two prior to this photo being taken, so it was a nice way to kind of uh, get away for a little bit and, uh, you know, a bond, if you will. Um, so the motor itself um, was advertised as good condition. You know, the guy told me it had like a reman transmission, uh, as you can see by the sticker there, um, that everything had been rebuilt at some point in the van's life. Um, but when I had pulled the intake off uh, prior to power washing it, you know, I found uh, water in the intake uh, ports of the head. So not a great start. My theory is that the guy pulled it out of the van uh, running and driving, uh, and then let it sit outside for a couple days while while all the um, you know folks came on Facebook Marketplace and looked at it. So um, my advice is, you know, if you're going to go look at an engine, pull the plugs out, um, uh, turn it over with the breaker bar and the crank. You know, make sure it has some compression. 
Um, it doesn't have any sort of, you know, major mechanical issues. Maybe pull a valve cover if you can. Um, and you can see here that I've got the trainee off of the engine, um, you know, kind of hung from the cherry picker there, just generally inspecting the condition. Um, so the idea is get yourself a, uh, an engine with known history. Um, try to get a, an entire running dropout if you can. Um, if, it, if it comes out of a running and driving vehicle, you're just that much further ahead. You know, you at least know that this thing uh, moves and doesn't have any sort of, uh, you know, rod knock, uh, lifter knock, uh, valve train noise, transmission issues, you know, what have you. Uh, anything along those lines. Um, always a good idea to just have some history on it. Now the reality is is that you know not everyone is going to be able to find a running and driving vehicle. Um, a lot of us will just go to a junkyard and, uh, and pull it as is out of a wrecked vehicle. Um, but try to get the best that you can for the money um, and at the very least buy a complete engine. Don't buy something that has the heads off and the oil pan pulled and, and all this. You know if it's a good engine um, then why was it pulled apart, right? So kind of use that logic uh, and some common sense when getting into it. Um, this one had some broken exhaust bolts. They all do. Um, there's a nice little trick where you can actually uh, grab a welder um, and weld on the uh, exhaust, uh, or nut rather, onto the broken exhaust stud. Uh, and that is going to kind of build up the weld uh, and make you a bolt, so to speak, um, so that you can back it out. And the heat helps break any sort of corrosion or or any kind of crap that's built up in there and help you uh, get that stud out. Um, I really don't recommend the drilling method. Um, you know, it's just too easy to, to walk to the side and hit the aluminum head or hit a water jacket or something like that. So don't do that. Um, if you've got to drag the motor to a buddy's house with a welder or whatever, um, that's always a great idea to just do it this way for a low-risk uh, extraction procedure. Um, if everything goes right, you should be able to get the uh, exhaust stud out uh, and you have a nice little souvenir there um, ready to go. So. Uh, the upside was that, um, you know, once I got the, the water out of the motor, um, it turned over fine. I just pulled the plugs and kind of turned it over, um, and all the water shot out of the cylinders. I shot some WD-40 down the plug holes, and um, everything was great after that uh, in terms of just the motor turning over. Um, the valve train looked great. It looked like this thing had decent um, oil changes and maintenance throughout its life. Um, you know, I was, I was pretty happy about that. Um, I wish the same could be said about the transmission. So as I mentioned, this is a 4L ADE um, out of like an 04 uh, Express Van, Silverado, you know, whatever. Um, once I pulled the valve body off, you know, I kind of started to see some of the uh, sediment and burnt fluid um, and just some of the warning signs that this thing had not really been taken care of or, or had been overheated. Um, and looking inside the pan, that was kind of the... Um, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. This thing had just been absolutely overheated at some point and puked its guts all out um, into the pan. So, um, you know, I think the days of finding a good running 4L ADE in a junkyard um, pretty much have passed. You know, a lot of these transmissions are um, 20 years or, or more older at this point. Um, so they've kind of reached their, their life limit as far as the initial build. Um, so I'd go into the assumption that you just want to freshen up a transmission um, whether it be a 4L60E, 4L80E, um, I really don't recommend the 4L60E. I've never run one in an LS swap, um, just for the horror stories that they keep blowing up under even stock power. So um, the 4L80E is actually inexpensive enough that it, it doesn't make sense to buy a 60E. Um, the ADE is a great transmission, it's affordable, it's, it's uh, pretty easily rebuilt if you're relatively handy. Um, so I always recommend that, especially if you're doing anything more than stock power. Um, as I did later in the video uh, with the forced induction. The other thing you can do uh, if you've bought an engine uh, where you don't know what vehicle it came out of, so something that was kind of removed before you got there, um, is you can build a little sub-harness um, to talk to either a OBD2 scanner, um, which are really you know commonly available uh, you know on Amazon or whatever, like a little Bluetooth dongle, um, or even HP tuners uh, just to pull some of the information uh, from the computer. So I'll throw a photo up um, of the schematic um, of building that. Really, it's just the power ground and I think the serial bus um, that allows the computer to talk to the uh, scanner. So nice, easy way um, to at least verify, you know, VIN, displacement, um, you know, some of the basics um, of the computer that came with the truck. Um, the idea in the end uh, is to get yourself a good running baseline uh, for your engine. So um, now is a great time um, to replace any sort of gaskets um, on the engine. You know, I, I always recommend, and I've learned this the hard way, is that you want to replace uh, pretty much anything uh, as far as exterior gaskets go. So at the bare minimum, you know, you're talking um, valve cover gasket, oil pan gasket, 
uh, front and rear timing cover gaskets, rear main seal, front main seal, um, you know, really anything that's difficult to get to once, once the engine's in the car. You know, you think about uh, having to replace the rear main um, once the <laughs> engine and trans are already in the car. It's a nightmare. you got to pull the trans and so on. But doing it while it's on an engine stand or a cherry picker is just like a, you know, a half-hour job, if that. Um, if you're doing a cam swap, now's a great time, too. Um, super easy to pull off the balancer. Um, there's a ton of tools out there for it. Uh, slap in a cam, do valve springs, you know, whatever you have as far as uh, your planned upgrades, uh, really now is the time to do it. Um, it sure is a hell of a lot easier now uh, just to turn the motor around and, and do anything you need to do there. All right, let's get into the fun part. So this was the victim. This was the uh, Crown Vic that I ended up buying for the project. Um, I did buy it with the sole intention of engine swapping it, um, which made it a little bit easier uh, to negotiate some of the things uh, that I found wrong with the car. Um, if you are purchasing a car, um, you know, definitely take a look at all the various items like you normally would um, when buying a used car, um, you know, condition, history, that kind of stuff. Um, but for me, it, it, I was specifically looking for something that had mechanical issues, so either engine, transmission, um, you know, that would obviously be something that I could work into the uh, negotiation of the price. Uh, this specific car had, I think it had a good motor, uh, didn't make any noise or anything. Um, but there was some kind of a weird issue with the trans where it would go into limp mode after driving for a couple minutes uh, And then basically you could only start on second gear. So um, With that in mind, you know, I, I made my offer to the guy. I checked out the car um, And we ended up agreeing on a pretty reasonable price. I think it was like under two grand uh, Maybe a little bit less like 1500. Uh, it's been a couple years now um, He actually had a second car for sale second blue crown Vic um, You know, I really like the the New York State Police color um, it was iconic for me, you know, growing up and seeing those cars on the road uh, throughout the 2000s and 2010s. Um, the second car was a basket case, though. I mean, it had a, obviously some kind of an aftermarket paint job. Um, they had pretty much just spray bombed the entire exterior. A lot of overspray. The interior was pretty trashed. Um, you know, a lot of just spills and smells and just garbage. And it, it wasn't a place where I wanted to spend a lot of time. Uh, so I ended up going back to the first car uh, and picked that one up. Uh, original paint, um, you know, the interior was a pretty nice shape. Um, and again, just that mechanical issue. Uh, one cool thing I thought was uh, pretty interesting. Um, the guy was obviously a, a you know police car enthusiast. I show up and the guy had like a mid '80s Dodge uh, Monaco, or you know I'm not even sure Dodge Diplomat uh, what model that was, but kind of mid '80s cop car. Um, you know, super tough looking from all the <laughs> the '80s crime flicks and action movies that you've seen. Um, you know, you had like a Dodge Durango or something, you know, police uh, version and uh, some kind of a newer Challenger as well. So uh, definitely a Dodge guy. You could tell that he just picked up these cars from auction or whatever and, and uh, the Crown Vicks and sold them at a slight markup. But um, he had what I wanted and uh, so we settled on a deal. I will also mention um, that the car had about 150k on it, um, uh, 3,000 something idle hours. Uh, so the reason that's important is you want to make sure that, you know, the, the general chassis is in decent shape. So as far as brakes, suspension, bushings, uh, you know, things of that nature, um, you know, an LS swap is, uh, not necessarily expensive, but it's not inexpensive. So, um, you know, you want to budget in if you have to for, you know, brake upgrades and suspension upgrades and so on. Um, I ended up running mine pretty much box stock as far as brakes and suspension. Um, I think I maybe did pads and rotors just because they've been sitting for a little while, um, but otherwise, you know, it goes without saying, they're very capable cars uh, right out of the box in terms of, you know, rear end and axle uh, chassis. They don't need really any sort of reinforcing or stiffening. Um, the rear end was a 327 uh, ratio, which is excellent for any sort of boosted application. You know, some of these guys will go out and immediately they got to throw out, throw, you know, 410s and really aggressive gears at it. Um, I don't think that's necessary. You know, something that's anywhere in the threes. Um, I kind of go by the sloppy mechanics rule that anything in the threes is usually good enough to get you going um, for a boosted application. And, uh, you know, factory, power lock, or LSD, whatever you want to call it. Um, I really think I just changed the oil and the differential, um, added some friction modifier, and I was off to the races. It was, it was ready to go. So this next part isn't absolutely necessary, but um, if you're curious like I am, I, I wanted to hear the engine run before I got in the car. Um, because if it wasn't going to be good, it would come right back out, right? So I ended up rigging this on a cherry picker slash engine stand um, with a stock computer, aftermarket harness, a ghetto wiring system, uh, sorry, ghetto fuel system, um, and using the, you know, original motor out of the, the car uh, while it was still in it as a jump pack. 
Um, so I'll show some footage of that here. A little bit scary, <laughs> not necessarily recommended to do it this way. Um, but I would definitely, um, you know, if you're going to do it um, on an engine stand, then do it on a legit engine stand so you don't risk any sort of um, injury or fire or harm to yourself. Alright, she lights off. Blooded. Here's the plan. Super simple, I'm telling you. We're gonna take this, we're gonna take it out and throw it far away. And then we're gonna take this. Hold on, I got distracted. <laughs> Did you get the rab? Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Okay, you were saying? Are you good? Yep. Are you ready? Yep. So we're gonna take this mm -hmm. and chuck it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take this guy, six liters of just magic goodness. Take this guy and put it right here. It's that simple. Out, in. Could anyone do it? Yes. <laughs> Nor, anyone can do it. What's your secret? Um, well, you know, what I like to do is just soak myself in transmission fluid for a couple hours and that gives me some magical powers and then I wash it down with some IPAs and, you know, it's ready to go. Do you have any advice for someone that doesn't want to get into cars and does not care about them at all? Come spend an evening right here. It'll be a great time. And you will never want to work on anything ever again. <laughs> oh, it'll be fun. <laughs> Alright, so we get the car home. I pretty much drove it stock like it was for maybe a month or so. Uh, and then I said, well, it's time to jump in. Um, so I'll pull the engine transmission out the top. Um, pretty easy to do. Um, I like to do it on my lift just because um, you know it's a lot easier to get underneath to do any sort of um, you know undo any sort of suspension or uh, you know engine mounts things like that uh, just wiring plumbing whatever you know draining fluids uh, and then you go into the chair picker um, you know undo your cross member and motor mounts and take it out. Um, I had the motor for sale with the trans on marketplace. I think I asked like 400 bucks for the set you know as a pair. Um, I just wanted it gone. It was taking up space in my driveway. Um, they use these in everything, you know, obviously from F-150s to Panzer platforms to whatever. So uh, a guy came and bought it, I think for like 350 bucks, um, which was fine. You know, I just wanted it gone. Um, told him it had an issue with the trans or limp mode or whatever, and he said that's cool, no problem. So um, cool shot here of the car, you know, just with the engine and transmission out. Um, you know, you can see how high up it sits in the front end. Um, definitely going to come back down once you get that iron LS in there and especially with the weight of the turbo kit and, the, and all the other various um, accessories. Um, so this is important here as far as the uh, setup into the engine bay. So you can see the aluminum cross member um, which was standard on the 03 to 11 cars. Um, basically the stock motor mounts sit down in those uh, pedestals where the two holes are uh, just behind the steering rack. Um, it's very easy to get these engines into these cars. Uh, I ended up using a set of uh, adapter plates um, for a 4.6 Mustang to an LS. Um, very easy. I just ended up bolting up the stock Crown Vic rubber isolator mounts to these adapter plates and then bolted the adapter plates to the motor. Um, and then it almost dropped right in. Um, I say almost because the studs were a little bit wider uh, dimensionally um, than the holes in the cross member. So I did have to go in with a die grinder and just kind of um, elongate the holes in the cross member 
uh, where the uh, engine mount studs sat. Um, but again, nothing that couldn't be taken care of in about 10 minutes with a die grinder. Um, no real fabrication, cutting, welding, nothing like that. It was pretty nice to be able to just drop it right in. Um, as far as the engine goes, um, now's the time to get it dressed to go in. Um, so you're going to want to put on the right oil pan for the application. Um, engine mounts, you know, we just talked about. So for the oil pan, you want a rear sump um, that's used on pretty much the vast majority of LS swaps uh, and OEM applications. Um, I used a an F body, so a 98 to 02 Camaro pan uh, for my swap. It fit just fine. Um, those are getting kind of tough to come by now, used. Um, but luckily, there's a lot of aftermarket applications. So you can also use like a Holly uh, 3021 pan, uh, 302-1. Um, that's a really nice solution. You can get the the Holly one. You can get a knockoff. Um, you know, they're both pretty good options depending on your uh, price point. But you definitely want a rear sump pan. And that'll put you where you need to be as far as uh, oil pan clearance. So once you get your oil pan and motor mounts installed, uh, make your modification to the cross member. Um, pretty easy to just drop the motor in. Um, because of the motors going so far back um, in the engine bay, I like to come in from the side. Um, the lift, like I said, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, but certainly you don't need a lift for this. You can do it on jack stands or, or whatever. Um, it just takes a little bit of creative positioning of the uh, cherry picker. Um, the motor itself fits really nice. You know, we, we all know how compact and, and um, easy to fit the LSs are. And, you know, it's a big contrast to the big um, overhead cam uh, stuff, uh, the, you know, the two valve, three valve, whatever uh, Ford motors. Um, you will definitely want to keep um, the truck accessories. Um, one of the benefits of the Panther platform is that um, you have sufficient uh, hood clearance um, as well as uh, frontal clearance between the engine and the radiator. Uh, to be able to use that stuff so you know a lot of guys will go out and try to buy f-body accessories or you know corvette accessories ls1 intakes and that stuff is getting again harder to find expensive um whereas the truck stuff is everywhere you know junkyards uh, parts stores you know whatever so um again one of the benefits to having um, a dropout or an entire engine that you buy is that you don't have to buy a water pump a starter um, an alternator um, a power steering pump you know all that kind of stuff so um, it's really a benefit to have that stuff on there and just keep the truck uh, accessories and intake. In terms of a transmission cross member, I did reuse the stock cross member. Um, it's a stamped and welded assembly from the factory um, with a lot of oddball bends in it. It's actually a press fit um, in the brackets between the frame rails and it's very difficult to get out. Mine was um, not only press fit but also kind of seized from just years of corrosion so I had to beat it out with a hammer and a, a very long pry bar. Um, I reused mine by cutting and welding it uh, significantly. Uh, my recommendation would be to just use a piece of rectangular stock, um, you know, rectangular beam, um, and just weld a tab on that uh, to support like a typical GM transmission mount. Uh, you can see the transmission mount hanging off the end of the tail shaft housing in this photo. Um, going forward, the uh, methodology that I take with, you know, um, LS swaps as far as custom mounts and, and transmission mounts. Um, I have this old scrap LS1 block um, that had a bunch of damage to it and also this uh, bare 4L ADE case um, that also is missing a chunk as you can see. Um, this stuff weighs way less than an entire engine and transmission so it's a lot easier to just kind of slide in the engine bay, mock it up in there, um, but with, with how easy it is to get it into the Crown Vic you don't absolutely have to have this. Um, another thing that you'll want to keep um, is the uh, factory Crown Vic um, cooling package so that's going to be your radiator. AC condenser if you choose to use that, and also the power steering cooler. Um, I did use a stock radiator. Uh, I just adapted it with various, you know, uh, hoses. You know, do the thing where you go to your uh, local auto parts store, um, pick out the hoses that you think fit, uh, and then trim them to, um, uh, to match. I think uh, a combination of like a factory truck upper hose and then maybe like a Camaro lower hose. Uh, I don't recall exactly, but um, the sizes are all pretty darn close, so it's, it's easy to uh, adapt them. And now it's time for my least favorite topic, which is wiring. Um, there's many different options uh, for engine management, wiring, harnesses, etc. Um, for this specific build, I went with a stock GM PCM, so that's the computer that came out of the 04 van. Um, I did use an aftermarket uh, wiring harness, a standalone uh, wiring harness. Um, this is an offshore, you know, knockoff harness that I picked up on Amazon, I think it was. Um, I've heard mixed reviews about these, you know, some people complain about the quality, that things are wired wrong, whatever. 
Um, I had no issues with mine. I, I thought it was, you know, well built for the price. Um, obviously, it's not a the, the best <laughs> of the market um, that it has to offer, but it served my purposes just fine. Um, having done the, the stock ECU thing a couple times now in a few different builds, um, I've since gone to Holly Terminator X on my latest build, um, my Jaguar XJ6 uh, with the Turbo LS. And with that being said, I probably will never go back to a um, stock ECU uh, and HP tuners if I can help it. It's just a lot easier interface. And, and e even economically, um, you know, it, it, you have to question the dollars and cents of Terminator X versus a stock ECU, right? So with a stock ECU, you're looking at the ECU buying a harness or paying someone to thin yours out. You're talking wideband, um, all the ancillaries, and then paying a tuner to tune your car. Um, whereas with the uh, Terminator X, you know, it's all a one-stop shop and basically you've got a limited tuning capability um, in your hands. Um, so make, make the decision that's right for you. Um, it's not one size fits all. Um, uh, but like I said, I, I went with the Terminator X on my current build and I'm really enjoying it uh, for what you pay. Uh, you get quite a bit. I'm very happy with it. Um, in terms of wiring, I really, <laughs> it goes to show how, how little I enjoy it. I really only have one picture that I took, uh, through the course of the build, which is just basically me doing a little bit of troubleshooting over the fender of the car. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, it's just not my forte. Um, I got the car fired up, um, after a few months of just trying to get it going in an NA form, um, you know, with, before the turbo and it had a quick issue. Um, which actually says a lot about, um, you know, just kind of paying attention to detail. The only problem that I had was that I didn't seat the boost valve um, in the transmission all the way, so that's part of the HD2 kit, and it must have popped out. Um, the snap ring must have let loose, so I had to drop the transmission pan, uh, made a bit of a mess here on the floor, uh, but ultimately got that boost valve seated, and then I had all gears uh, moving around, so... Um, here's a clip of the car just idling in the driveway for the first time after I got it started. Um, it was a pretty cool moment, you know, in the middle of winter, obviously. It's uh, probably the least motivating time uh, as far as car projects go, but it was nice feeling to get that going and uh, see it running. So I drove the car with a stock cam probably for a month or two, um, just kind of bombing around doing cop car things, you know, bombing through gigantic puddles and jumping train tracks and just the kind of things that you, the reason you buy a police car for, um, to just have general hoonery, if you will. Um, I got bored with the power pretty quickly, um, you know, I'd get out there and with the stock truck motor, cam, etc., breathing through the stock Crown Vic mufflers. I mean, we're probably talking somewhere between like, I don't know, 250 to 280 wheel horsepower, um, maybe on a good day. So um, that obviously got boring pretty quickly um, in, a, in a full weight, full size car like that. So, um, so the modification started pretty quick. Um, I basically uh, drank the Kool-Aid, got right into the don't BS me um, mindset of the sloppy mechanics lifestyle. Um, sloppy stage two cam, pack 12, 18 springs, um, and basically tuned it myself for those uh, items, uh, which made it a little more fun to drive, um, in preparation for the turbo, obviously. Um, fun little trick here. If you don't feel like, um, removing the battery terminals and removing the starter to install the lock on your flex plate in order to lock the crankshaft so that you can loosen the crank pulley bolts, um, you can just chain the balancer to the frame of the car and then use a, you know, sufficient either half inch or three quarter ratchet or whatever with a big old breaker bar and break that bolt loose. Um, my electric impact and my, uh, pneumatic impact don't have the guts to loosen that bolt. Um, but the breaker bar, you know, usually within a five seconds or so you can get it loose once you really lean on it. So a bit of a time saving trick that I found that really worked for me. Um, and of course the ubiquitous uh, dot to dot um, photo uh, when doing a cam swap. Um, just a nice little piece of insurance to make sure that you timed it correctly. Um, I don't degree my cams or anything. I never have done that. Um, I've done probably, I don't know, five or six cam swaps in LSs. Uh, I never had an issue just doing the dot to dot method. Um, it's worked pretty well for me and I'm going to continue to do it that way until I have an issue. 
Um, soft tune the car using HP tuners. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier, a bit of a learning curve with HP tuners. Um, there's a lot of different parameters to get into once you start doing, uh, especially modifying like the fuel system for, you know, injectors and VE tables. And, you know, I, I'm not really an expert at that stuff, right? I just wanted to kind of get the car going um, and enjoy it. So definitely one of the places where HP tuner shows its limitations. Um, you really have to invest quite a bit of time to become proficient in HP tuners. Um, and I just didn't want to involve, involve that myself in that kind of uh, time. Car was pretty fun with the cam swap though. Um, made for a really nice lope at idle and picked up a ton of power everywhere. Um, you know, if you hadn't heard about it, just go through the sloppy stage two cam and there's a ton of reading on it. Um, but, you know, more than I need to talk about here, but uh, generally just all around a good upgrade. Here's where I had my f basically first and only real mechanical issue with the car um, uh, regarding the drive shaft. Uh, you can actually reuse the stock drive shaft um, for your swap. I have a this is a 2011 model, so it's the aluminum police drive shaft. Um, all that was needed was a, I believe it was a 1350 U joint up front, um, and I reused the stock yoke that came with the uh, 4L80E that the slip yoke. Um, I just pressed in the new uh, U joint uh, to convert it. Um, I must not have seated the <laughs> clips correctly in the U-joint because it came apart on me on the, on the highway doing probably 80 miles an hour and exploded in a spectacular fashion. Um, the front of the drive shaft whipped around, the rear of the drive shaft whipped around, and basically I just looked in the rearview mirror and I saw the drive shaft frisbeeing off the throughway, off into the median, uh, the grass median, so that thing was gone pretty quickly. Um, got the car back home and basically salvaged what was left of the uh, slip yoke uh, and I had a new drive shaft made um, with 1350 U-joints um, front and rear um, at the uh, correct length. Uh, this is a steel unit just because it was easy, um, easily available at my local Fleet Pride. Um, you don't need any sort of exotic drive shaft for this swap. Um, this drive shaft saw probably north of five or six hundred foot-pounds uh, once the turbo was in front of it and it had no issues. So. Um, steel is perfectly fine and, and a very economical option uh, for these swaps. All right, we made it. It's turbo time. Um, I started things off by getting a turbo log manifold. This is just an offshore eBay type log manifold. Um, really anyone will work. I'm a huge fan of using the cast uh, stuff. Um, it retains heat better, which helps spool. Uh, I need a little bit of cleanup work with a die grinder to, to fit the plugs, but no big deal. Uh, I know Holly offers a, a log, a turbo log that's pretty good. Um, I would caution against using the tubular up and forward header type turbo manifolds. Um, I've really only heard just uh, horror stories about those things cracking and, and just being generally bulky and big uh, and making it tough to access spark plugs. Um, plenty of room for uh, the manifold, the turbo, um, etc. I did have to relocate my coolant reservoir um, there on the passenger uh, driver side, I'm sorry, passenger wheel well. Uh, but plenty of room for a 3-inch downpipe, uh, which was plenty for me at the time. Um, gotta love the quick and dirty method of the wastegate mounting. Um, I did mine right to the turbine housing. Uh, nothing fancy, just drilled myself a hole. Uh, drilled myself a much bigger hole, ground it out, um, and then verified my wastegate pressure uh, using this little apparatus I put together with a uh, uh, just a, basically a regular coming off, regulator coming off my compressor. Um, as far as welding the wastegate uh, to the turbine housing, no big deal. Um, I didn't use anything exotic. I just used basically stainless wire and a MIG welder um, with C25 uh, shielding gas, which is pretty much everything uh, what I use for all of my uh, exhaust welding. Um, so decided to go uh, up with the downpipe just for fun, just to kind of shake it out and see how things uh, sounded and felt with the turbo setup and then, uh, you know, make a quote-unquote real downpipe and real exhaust later. Um, and admittedly, this is pretty fun. I drove like this for probably a couple days, and uh, it was fun. It was extremely loud uh, and annoying, so I ended up, um, you know, doing a real downpipe and connecting to the back of the exhaust. I did use a 
loud valve or a boost activated cutout valve, uh, and I pretty much use this on all my builds. Um, you can get them on eBay, you know, uh, probably Amazon, Alibaba, all the usual, uh, or AliExpress, I should say, uh, all the usual places. Uh, and I know they make you know the actual loud valve, loud valve version. Um, <clears throat> I used it in a three inch, so basically this comes on and opens up as soon as it sees a boost reference, um, and then it shuts when it uh, sees uh, you know ambient or vacuum. Um, <clears throat> which blowing through the stock exhaust, the car is very quiet around town, and you get into it and it just absolutely rips and screams, which is the best of both worlds. Um, the intercooler install is pretty easy. This is just the typical air-to-air -air that comes with all the Denmark kits um, off the VS Racing website. Um, very easy to install. I just made some brackets for it uh, to hang it, and then drilled some holes using a throw hole saw at the front bumper uh, to get it some airflow. I did have to clearance the crash bar. I just took a, do a cutoff wheel, and I just cut some massive slits in it and knocked out the center uh, sheet metal portion uh, to get some additional airflow in there. Uh, and ended up working just fine uh, and made up some intercooler piping as well uh, to connect to the throttle body. Um, this was pretty much the final iteration of the car um, in terms of layout. Um, you know, I just kind of bombed around in it and started to enjoy it from here. It was really, you know, the, the final setup. Um, did some street tuning. Um, Pretty much on 93 pump gas. I didn't really venture into the ethanol world, uh, which I kind of wish I had. Um, but the car was awesome. I got it up to probably 14 pounds of boost, um, 93, and it was a riot. I just had a great time with it. So what was next? I pretty much enjoyed the car for the whole summer of 2021. Um, here it is with my OG M3, and then behind it we have my old uh, E9. I'm sorry, E90 335i. Uh, it was a fun uh, year-round car. Um, basically, just spent the summer and fall just wasting tires. I, I think I went through like four or five sets of rear tires, uh, just absolutely obliterating them. Uh, a ton of fun to drive around town. Um, you know, with the gear ratio and, and the uh, circle D converter, it was just a great combo. Um, able to get up on boost pretty easily and, and just basically waste, this t waste the tires uh, on demand uh, at any speed under 40 miles an hour. So uh, really good, good time. Uh, overall, uh, a great car to, to do the swap in. Um, I did a lot of just basic Crown Vic things with it. You know, still have a gigantic trunk where you can uh, bring home firewood and all sorts of goodies like that. You know, um, take the kids out to ice cream, take the car to work, uh, go to car shows, car meets. Um, this is my buddy's, I think it's a 1970 or so uh, C10. It's got a, a real aluminum LS1. Um, they used to have a T56, and he actually swapped it to a uh, ADE uh, after driving uh, one of my cars and really liking the automatic. So uh, super cool truck, um, and it was a nice day to kind of park these two things together at work uh, and compare and contrast. Um, and you know what? Ultimately, it ended up pretty, being a pretty decent family car, too. Um, the only amenity that the car did not have is air conditioning. Uh, I'm from the Buffalo area, so it really wasn't necessary for me. Uh, most of the year, the temperatures don't really get above 75 degrees, so just uh, crack the windows open and enjoy yourself. Uh, worked out pretty well. Um, you know, in closing, uh, would I do this swap again in the car? Uh, absolutely. You know, it's a big car. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's inexpensive, it's easy to work on, it's readily available. Uh, there's a ton of aftermarket support for them, and, and it seems like there's still plenty of examples out there that are you know, not totally beaten to death, not totally rotted out, um, although that statement may change you know, as, as the years go on. Um, so what was the fate of the car? Uh, I actually ended up scrapping the car. 
Um, it was due for some maintenance and I needed to pull the engine to uh, just to tweak a couple things, change some gaskets, um, kind of mess around with the trans a little bit. And while doing that, I found some pretty terminal rust um, pretty much all along the underside of the body. Um, there were some sections big enough to fit my fist through, and I am by no means a body man, and I did not want to spend any time on my back, you know, welding patch panels and painting and all that kind of crap. So uh, I ended up parting the car out. I kept the motor and the trans um, and the turbo setup, and I ended up uh, parting out basically the entire interior, doors, hood, front and rear end. Um, you know, the front subframe was sold to a buddy who's going to use it under a Ford, you know, vintage Ford uh, 60s pickup. Uh, the, the rear 8.8 went to a buddy um, with, I think, like a square body Chevy, and he's going to use it, um, build it up and use it for a drag setup. Uh, and the rest I just ended up scrapping. Um, really, I just kind of got sheet metal price uh, at the scrapyard for it. I couldn't really leave well enough alone. I love the Turbo LS combo, and I wanted to try something a little bit different, a little more vintage. So I went out and picked this thing up. It was a, it's a 1984 uh, Jaguar XJ6. Um, older gentleman owned it and was tired of putting money into it and couldn't find any sort of competent mechanic to deal with the, the ancient English 80s uh, electronics and fuel injection and all that. So I grabbed it for a uh, what I consider a fair price and uh, dragged it home. Uh, it was non-running, so again, perfect kind of situation with the uh, mechanical issues, but the body being great, you know, new paint job, pretty decent interior and so on. Um, I've actually had this car done for about two years now. I've been driving it pretty much, you know, three seasons, um, spring, summer, fall. Um, same 6 liter, same turbo, same transmission, converter, everything, um, and it's a riot. So if you guys want to see more videos about the Jag, I'd love to make one. Um, again, it's a burnout machine, ice cream getter, commuter, grocery getter, you know, family, car, etc. Um, thanks very much for watching. If you guys have any sort of comments, please leave them. I'd love to hear feedback from you on, uh, on my projects. Uh, if you don't mind subscribing, I would greatly appreciate if you uh, would consider that. And uh, until next time, thanks again.